All right, it's time for the weekly paragraph. Picked a somewhat shorter segment today, just three verses, um, because uh, that sets us up for a nice six verse finish to chapter one next week. Um, this uh, week's verses, three verses, continue on uh, to talk about uh, Judas Iscariot. So the verses right before uh, these last week basically said, Peter stands up, um, brothers and sisters, uh, the scripture had to be fulfilled concerning Judas. Uh, he was numbered in our ministry. Um, and then basically, uh, Peter is next week, Peter is going to replace Judas uh, with Matthias. Um, but we have these verses here that tell us uh, the, the fate of Judas uh, after uh, he betrayed Jesus. So here's the verses. Therefore, this man, Judas, on the one hand, he acquired a field from the reward of unrighteousness, and having become headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels poured out. There's some interesting Greek uh, that I suppose we'll do uh, tomorrow, or I might actually do it on Tuesday. Um, I'm uh, behind with the scholar part, part of last week. Um, not not uh, going to do a lot with the scholar uh, from last week. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, the disciples and especially uh, uh, the zealot, uh, Simon the Zealot. Who were the zealots? Um, what were some of the revolutionary movements um, around the time of Christ? So a pretty light scholar week uh, to catch up. Yesterday was a graduation and uh, many other things, prom and uh, uh, sports events. So anyway, uh, I'll probably do the scholar from last week tomorrow. But uh, let's look a little bit at, at these verses. So uh, this is a different picture uh, than we see in Matthew 27. Uh, let me just read Matthew 27. So Matthew is the only gospel that um, seems to imply that Judas was repentant. Now, we tend to blur all the gospels together, but each gospel has a special uh, themes and special offerings. And in the gospel of Matthew, Judas seems repentant. Now, maybe not truly repentant, but he, he realizes that he has made a huge mistake, it seems, uh, in the book of, of Matthew. And so Judas goes back and tries to give the high priest the money, I think uh, trying to stop the crucifixion. This is where we get the idea that maybe, just maybe, Judas was trying to force God's hand. Now, you know, it's, it's a, it, we're trying to read between the lines, but there, there's one kind of narrative that would go like this. Judas is upset because Jesus is the Messiah, and he's supposed to be uh, moving forward with the revolution, and, the, and, and God's going to come and, and take care of everything. Uh, but Jesus is, isn't pushing it, and so Judas thinks, I'm going to help him out. I'm going to force his hand. God's not going to let Jesus be arrested. God's not going to let Jesus be you know, put to death or anything like that. I'm going to turn him over to the Romans, and then dun, 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 God will, will miraculously um, turn everything around, and Jesus will become uh, who he is, the king. And, and so there's one theory uh, that Judas was trying to force God's hand to rescue Jesus and, in fact, destroy the Romans. Again, we can't prove any of this. But if that's true, <coughs> he was wrong. Uh, he didn't understand God's plan. Um, so that's one narrative. And so in Matthew 27, Judas takes the money back to the high priest. You know, he says, you know, take it back, take it back. You know, I, I changed my mind. Well, it's too late. Um, and so he throws the money at the money chain, at the, uh, uh, the, the leaders. And, um, and in Matthew, it is the, uh, it says here, the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury. It's blood money. Uh, so they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for, for strangers and aliens and foreigners. Isn't that nice of them? Uh, very noble. Uh, take the blood money and use it for something good. Um, and so uh, that is why that field has been called a keldama or field of blood uh, to this day. Now, that's a different scenario here. Are there ways to harmonize them? Well, sure, we can harmonize anything. Well, not really, but you can, we can harmonize these. You could say uh, uh, Judas went back and got the money after they didn't take it, or, um, or maybe here where it says um, he, bought a, he acquired a field, maybe that's kind of somewhat less than literal. Uh, but you can see the tensions. In Matthew, 
the chief priest by the field. Here, Judas buys the, pre, the field. Um, Matthew, by the way, as far as I can tell, is the only gospel that says that G Judas went out and hanged himself. Um, and it doesn't say here in Acts uh, that Judas uh, hanged himself. It says he fell. Um, and so I've, I've heard scenarios, you know, where Jesus hangs himself on a cliff, the rope breaks, he falls down, his, his, his bowels pour out. Um, there was a time where being able to come up with those kinds of harmonizing schemes uh, was important for me. But I, I've come to believe that as I've, you know, I've been in this, this uh, biblical studies now for some time. Um, I think if you were to sit down, this is my opinion, if you were to sit down with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and painstakingly go verse by verse by verse, you would eventually come to the conclusion that maybe that's not what God intended. That is to say that it was not God's intent, intention for these to be precise videotapes of what happened. Each, that, and that maybe that quest, the quest for harmonization, is a misguided quest, uh, that, it, that, that it loses focus of the point. So whether there was one blind man or two blind men or whether it was going into Jericho or coming out of Jericho, that misses the entire point, which is that Jesus could heal blind people. Um, um, and I think, actually, from a historical standpoint, this variety actually bespeaks to there actually being an event that happened in Jericho where Jesus healed at least one blind person. Um, and so uh, after, after going through you know, the, 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 the painstaking uh, uh, time of, of doing this kind of detailed uh, comparison, I, I finally concluded that this is, this is just not the, this is a mistaken sense of what we're supposed to do with the Gospels. And then, in fact, some people lose their faith because of this. Because some people, ah, you know, how many denials did Peter have? Harold Lenzel famously suggested that maybe Peter denied Christ six times, you know, three times before first crow, and, and three more times before a second crow. Well, Linzel has come up with a scenario that is far more different from any of the Gospels than the Gospels are different from each, each other. He's created a fifth Gospel uh, of his own. Uh, after studying the, the parameters of ancient history, I just don't think that's what uh, ancient history writing, th those are not the parameters of ancient history writing. And that the focus is not on getting all the details, you know, in the way a modern history book uh, that's not the point. Um, these are not videotapes. So again, you can harmonize these two, but I think probably that's that's both misguided and something that will cause some people to lose their faith because some people will stake their faith on being able to fit all these details together. And once they become convinced, or if they become convinced that they can't do it, they may have a faith crisis for no reason at all. This is not something to have a faith crisis about. Um, in, in, you know, as I've sometimes said, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Ding, I'm good. Okay, well, so actually I, I wonder if Luke, uh, I, I think Luke had Matthew. Um, that's my hunch. Luke actually had the Gospels of Matthew and, and Mark. And if so, then Luke knows that this is a little bit different uh, from Matthew's account. And he must, he must do this intentionally in full knowledge of what Matthew has. Well, maybe we'll speculate a little bit on that when we get to the scholar uh, video at the end of this week. Well, uh, it became known to all the ones dwelling in Jerusalem uh, that the field was called in their own dialect a keldama, that is, field of blood, um, which is uh, the Aramaic for uh, field of blood. Now, uh, again, this slight tension between Matthew and Acts on how the field was purchased and everything, you know, you can get caught up on, ah, oh, there's a tension here. Um, and I'm not saying they can't be harmonized. I'm just saying I don't think that's the right impulse or the right drive to try to harmonize all these or feel like they have to be. Um, from a historical standpoint, this suggests that there was a field of blood uh, that, that was there. Uh, and that it, anyway, and, and that he purchased it with blood money. That, that seems to be a historical kernel. Um, okay, now we have some Psalms that are quoted here, Psalm 69, and I think Psalm 103, 109, Psalm 60, uh, sorry, Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. And um, these two Psalms are uh, not specifically uh, prophetic. Uh, they are Psalms of lament, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, so, uh, the Holy Spirit has quickened a couple of verses uh, from these psalms 
uh, in relation to uh, events in, in, in terms of Judas. Now, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, certainly knew uh, that these verses would be relevant to Judas. And so, um, uh, absolutely, we can say that the Holy Spirit inspired these verses uh, to be ready uh, for Luke when he was writing Acts 1, they, to, to pop, to zap. Uh, but I suspect that these verses had their own meaning within the original uh, people of Israel and the Psalter. And as uh, I, I, so uh, it seems almost certain that the, the Israelites and the Jews read these Psalms as Psalms of lament with no thought of someone who would betray the Messiah, that that is a, a additional um, hidden meaning, as it were, or census plenier uh, that the Holy Spirit impregnated the Psalms with, just ready to go uh, for when uh, Luke would, would read those um, those Psalms. And of course, it may have been uh, individuals before Luke who read the Psalm that way. Well, we've got a lot of interesting things to talk about uh, in the scholarly uh, video at the end of the week. Uh, but here are three verses uh, for this week from Acts 1, verses 18 through 20.